We're starting out in chapter 10 by talking about syllables. Now we read the first two paragraphs, or we got through the first two paragraphs as I remember. And to continue, um, we reviewed the word segments, which is a blanket term for vowels and consonants, and then we also are reviewing suprasegmental features, things like length and stress, intonation, all of those things that are above and beyond individual vowels and consonants. And uh, we're now at the bottom of page 243. Most syllables contain both vowels and consonants, but some such as I and O have only vowels. So we can have words with only vowels, nothing else. And I and O are both diphthongs, but it doesn't have to be a diphthong. For example, E is a possible word. The letter E, we can call that a word. So it doesn't even have to be a diphthong. One simple vowel can form a word. Many consonants can also function as syllables. Alveolar laterals and nasals, as at the ends of button and bottle, are common in English, but other nasals may occur, as in blossom and bacon. Now, as we mentioned last semester, Pronouncing these as syllabic nasals is more common in which variety of English? Which variety of English is it more common to pronounce them as true syllabic syllables, syllabic nasals rather? In, right, in British, in British, standard British English, it's more likely to be actual um, syllabic nasals. For button, it's true. In American, that is also a syllabic na nasal. But uh, and it's not just nasals we're talking about. We're including often liquids, like in bottle. But I do not have a syllabic o for bottle, as you know. If I said bottle, bottle, with my cheek puffing up, then that would be a syllabic l, because there's no vowel there at all. My tongue does not leave the alveolar ridge at all from the t. Bottle, bottle, all right. But I say bottle. I've got a tap. And tap, by definition, means the tongue cannot cannot stay too long on the alveolar ridge. And I code mix a lot in this class, don't I? Mixing up Mandarin and English. I don't notice it myself sometimes. The reason I mention this is because I just went to the Xie Shi Yin. A lot of you were there. And CJ told me that they are probably going to be translating this course for Zimu so that more people can access it the video version. And at first I was thinking, are oh, you going to translate it into Chinese? He said, well, the main purpose for uh, translating and providing subtitles was to make Chinese courses available to more of the world. That was the original purpose. So I said, for this course, you're going to have to translate both ways, constantly back and forth. So the English to the Chinese and then the Chinese to English. And. Uh, I said, well, if you find anything really off the wall in the video, can you please let me know and we'll do some more editing. He said, I probably won't tell you. We need some entertainment, you know. <laughs> OK. All right, so I do not have syllabic L, basically. It may turn up in some cases, but normally I have a vowel there. A tap, by definition, is that your tongue So uh, button, syllabic N. Bot, bottle, bottle in British, and bottle for me is not syllabic. There can also be other possibilities. For example, blossom. Do I have a syllabic nasal there? Blossom. No, I do not. But if I said blossom, blossom, then it would be, and, excuse me, and bacon. Bacon I don't, but if I say bacon and eggs, or, or bacon grease, that's, I keep forgetting the right example. Bacon grease. Bacon grease. Then I've got a syllabic nasal. I've got a glottal stop in there. In German, as I mentioned before, they do this all the time. And they do not have to be home organic. So, guten Morgen, guten Morgen, guten Morgen, Morgen, Morgen. It should be Morgen. G is what place of articulation? And then N is N is what place of articulation? Alveolar. Alveolar, not all, al, yeah. Alveolar, 
So are they home organic? No. So German does not have that jian that they have to be home organic. They don't have to be. So morgen, morgen, morgen. It's syllabic. So what happens to the N? Morgen, what happens to the N when I say morgen? It assimilates to the G, the velar, so morgen. And that's just typical for German overall. They do not have to be home organic. Um, so he says Blasman Bacon, particularly in phrases such as Blasman may fade, Blasman may, because we're going into May, so we kind of landa tong s dao um. We just go Blasman may, Blasman may, and then I may have a syllabic nasal. And Bacon goes well, or like the other example, Bacon grease, Bacon goes well. We're getting syllabic nasals. So his point here was that. Many consonants can also function as, as syllables, line two of the paragraph, in which the following sounds aid the assimilatory process. So what assimilates to what usually? What, what manner of articulation will assimilate to what manner of articulation? So do we say, um, um, do we say, Morgen, or it would be hard to do it differently. Morden. Morgen or Morden in German. Morgen or Morden. The first one or the second one? The first one. Okay, what happened in the second one? That's not correct German. Yeah. What happened in the second one? What happened in the first one? What assimilated to what? The alveolar nasal assimilated to the velar, voice velar stop, right. If I said molden, then it would be the, the velar stop assimilating to a final alveolar nasal, but that doesn't happen. The point is, which one assimilates more easily to other sounds? Not just alveolar. Nasals in general. It's not particularly alveolar. It's nasals in general. In many languages, they tend to assimilate easily even if they don't have a rule for it. Uh, I asked about this for Georgian, because in Georgian, many of the sounds are very individuated. One of the, f the first word I ever wrote in the Georgian script was mango, and it's a in, in Georgian, and I may have told you last semester. And it's m, so m, a, n, g, o. But when you say it, I asked my teacher, do you say mango or do you say mango? You can hear the difference? And so he said, in theory, it's mango, but in practice, they often say mango. So because it's nasal, it assimilates easily. And I heard another Georgian word pronounced in a song. As you know, I'm going to Georgian, Georgia to sing. So I've been listening to some of the songs. And there's an instrument of West Georgia called the chonguri. So what do you think my question would be? Do we say chonguri or chonguri, right? Can you hear the difference? Chonguri or Chonguri. Okay? This is something we had to practice a long time because of Taiwan English, right? For example, a lot of people say rung instead of run, and they can't tell the difference. Rung instead of run. Is that right? In Taiwan English. So I was wondering if they would assimilate it, because it's very natural for nasals to assimilate. However, I listened carefully to the singing, and it was Chonguri. They didn't say chongguri. It's ch o n guri, chongguri, because they don't have a letter for ng in Georgian. They don't have a letter for ng. So if you want to make an ng sound, it's like we started out in English with an n plus a g. And apparently, at least in this song, they separated them. But in any case, nasals assimilate more easily than many kinds of sounds. Fricatives and stops may become syllabic in unstressed syllables such as suppose. Suppose and today. Suppose today. Oh, before we go on to that, I just wanted to repeat the Chinese example about uh, nasals. And you can, you can hear the assimilation easy in, in Chinese if you say, for example, very big, da, very tall. All right, did you assimilate? Did you assimilate? Did you say 很高 or 很高? 
Velar or alveolar? Velar. It's velar. The nasal assimilated. Hung gao. You didn't say hen gao. If someone says ta hen gao, you wouldn't really notice, right? It's okay. Ta zhen hen gao. 不会不会特别去注意 but normally you would say hen gao. All right. How about very full? Right? Do you assimilate? What do you do? Just say it a few times naturally. So ah, I today ate, I ate very full. I can't breathe. Usually, it's very full. Usually, it's very full. That's hard to do. But think of a sentence where "very full" comes out naturally. Do you assimilate or not, Carol? I'm very full. Yeah, very full, very full. But we need "hen." Okay, let's try that one. Very, very, very icy. Hen bing. 真的很冰。很冰吗？啊，很冰。Maybe because it's too separate. And bing is normally a noun anyway. Well, it's used as an adjective, but probably stands out more. Okay, let's work on 很饱 because that one works. That one has worked with other classes. Do you assimilate or not? Carol says yes. The rest of you? Are you sure, Wendy? I'm going to catch you sometime when you're assimilating. Ah, 我很饱，我很饱。Normally, I believe most Taiwanese will assimilate. 很饱，啊，很饱。Okay, so that was going back to the nasals. Let's come back again to sometimes um, fricatives and stops may also become syllabic and unstressed syllables. Suppose. Do you suppose he's going to come? Do you suppose? Suppose, and in Chinese you also do it. For example, with the meis, meis, meis. You don't always say meis. You don't always voice it. It's often a voiceless vowel. Meis, meis. Think about it. You know. Oh, I think you're not aware of it. People say it all the time. We're often not aware of what we say. Now, this is something we say really, really often. Very interesting. Very interesting. That's what you think. That's what you think. Record yourself a whole day, and you'll notice. This is really, is really common. Okay, so the this, that's fine. But if you're very emphatic, then you'll probably voice the vowel. 什么意思？ But 什么意思？意思 It's not emphatic enough if you're going to be emphatic. But watch yourself. I'm sure you say 意思 sometimes in the day. Uh huh. 这个字的意思没有没有意思 Okay. In any case, I often hear it devoiced. It's a voiceless vowel. So in that case, it has become a syllabic what? A fricative. That's right. And then today. Uh, we may also have a voiceless vowel there, and it may get really short, so it becomes a syllabic stop. Today, today, today. What are you doing today? T -t -t. Usually, there's a vowel there for me, a voiceless vowel. Um, suppose today in a narrow transcription. People vary in their pronunciation of these words and phrases. For us, they're all syllabic consonants, but others may consider all the examples in this paragraph as consisting of a consonant and an associated schwa. For me, I normally have a schwa. For most of these, not all of these, many of them, I have a schwa. Although it's difficult to define what is meant by a syllable, nearly everybody can identify individual syllables. If you consider how many syllables there are in minimization, let's count. Then, suprasegmental. Again, it's five. You can easily count them. That's because we agree on a definition. That's because, okay? That's because we agree on a definition of what a syllable is. Even if we can't articulate that definition, we agree on what counts as a syllable. So we come up with the same number. However, there are many cases where we're not so sure. For example, family, family. I'm saying it with two, but you learned it as family that has three, and we may often say something in between family. Now, is there a syllable there or not? Right? 
for a lot of words, literature, literature, literature. They do it more in British for that one. For a lot of words, we tend to have schwa elision, but there may be a little schwa left. So sometimes we're really not sure. That's ling dang bie luan. Actually, normally we know what a syllable is. We recognize it when we hear it. Each of these words has five syllables. Nevertheless, it is curiously difficult to state an objective phonetic procedure for locating the number of syllables and especially the boundaries between syllables in a word or a phrase in any language. And we've already discussed this because, first of all, every language has a different standard for what counts as a syllable. And we talked about Japanese. The word for jendan again is in Japanese. And it has how many we don't call them syllables, we call them mora or more or moras. Moras has gotten more common lately for the plural. M-O-R-A is the singular mora. It's a unit a bit smaller than a syllable, but it counts as a rhythmic unit in certain languages. For example, Japanese. We don't really want to call it a syllable, but it counts as an extra beat in Japanese. So if you ask a Japanese how many units are there in kantan, they will tell you four, four and not two. We would expect two. In, ja in Chinese, which is the origin of kantan, it comes from jiantan, we are sure it's only two syllables. Chinese is the one language where it's really, really easy to count syllables. The only time we have problem is in Taiwan when we have a final erhua and we don't know what to do. Is it xiao har or xiao hai er? <laughs> Taiwanese will say like xiao hua er or something like that. Hua oh, er, hua er, hua er, yeah. Okay, they'll make it an extra syllable in Taiwan. They'll make it an extra syllable in Taiwan because we simply don't use our hua most of the time. Now, I also want to ask you, do you say wan yi or wan yi? Wan yi. Yo er? Who does not have an er at the end? Raise your hand higher. Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five of you, you say wan yi. Some wan yi. Okay, I always say one year, always, because I don't have erhua. I mean, I've been in Taiwan longer than you, as I've mentioned many times. I don't tend to have erhua, but for certain frozen expressions, this is gu ding de, yi jing jie bing le, yi jing shi zhe ge yang zi. And also, when we're saying some one year, sometimes it's something funny or weird or strange. And when we talk about weird things, we tend to use weird sounds in our language. For example, in English, you can call it a thingamajig. A thingamajig. Now, that's a funny sounding word. The word is funny and it illustrates something funny we don't know. So, words that mean something strange, it will, they will often themselves have strange sounds to them. We talked before, like about xiao or jiong. Those are not common syllables in, in Mandarin. And they describe something awkward or strange. Or gan ga. How many words do we have that are pronounced ga? In Mandarin. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> That's right, it's from Southern Mean. Right. That's right. So when we have odd sounds, usually they're from another dialect. We borrow them to emphasize that something is odd or weird or awkward. Okay, I have a whole paper prepared on this that I haven't published yet. But it's iconic. <laughs> 它就像它所代表的东西. So that's an iconic use of odd sounds. Um, one year. Um, who says one year with an R? More than half of you then. One year. Some of one year. Okay, normally I think there should be an R there. My point was originally that in Chinese it's very, very easy to count syllables, except in cases like Erhua, right? because we're not really sure what to do with the er at the end in some cases. Either we drop it, we make it a separate syllable, or we incorporate it like they do in Beijing. Okay. Mm. So every language has their own standard. For Japanese, we've got more that are smaller than our syllable units. In Chinese, we have some problems, sometimes with er. Sometimes we have trouble with um, schwa elision. Have we done schwa elision in, the, in this class? Okay, so that's another thing that creates some cases where we're not sure. Um, if we want to generalize, though, to all languages, come up with a definition that applies to all languages, we can't do it, simply because different languages recognize different kinds of units and sounds as syllables. So n is a valid unit in Japanese, but it is not either in Chinese or in English. 
and sh is a valid unit in Bella Kula, but we don't recognize it in either Chinese or Japanese. But some Taiwanese think that a word like rush has two syllables before they learn what an English syllable is. So there's no way that we can come up with an objective definition because different languages do, different, do things different ways. And within a language, sometimes we also have some cases where we're really not sure. Some cases are in between. And remember, whenever you're doing any kind of shrill win and you want to come up with a theory and describe it, we like to have tidy theories that say something that shocks people. That's really interesting. It'll get their attention. But very often, things are not so black and white or clear cut. Most things exist on a continuum. So when we say, for example, um, literature or literature, we're not really secretary, secretary. We're not really sure if there's an extra syllable, secretary, secretary. Is there an extra syllable there or not? There's something in between. So things are just not as cut and dried, as gan cui, as we sometimes think we would like. Just remember that when you're coming up with a theory. Always remember, things are probably not going to be that, that distinct, that separated. Mm. It says that um, the boundaries between syllables in a word or a phrase in language is another problem because in English we have ambisyllabicity, right? Like melon or um, uh, a word with R in it. Perish, perish. R belongs to both sides. So how do we divide the syllables? That R belongs to both sides. That's another problem. Um, it is interesting that most people cannot say how many syllables there are in a phrase they have just heard without first saying the phrase themselves. We store it as an echo. We have to repeat it, and then we have to use our, we use our fingers. We use our fingers to count, because think of suprasegmental. Didn't we have to? Yeah, or you tap or something. But if you tap, you'll forget. If you use your fingers, you can see. So we have to repeat the sound. We had it as an echo. We repeat it, and then we have to count it, and then keep record with our fingers, unless you draw lines on a paper, which is more trouble. So we have to repeat it. We don't know instinctively how many syllables there are, unless it's very short. For example, today. I know that's two syllables. But super segmental, I had to count. We don't just know it automatically. We have to count. In a few cases, people disagree on how many syllables there are in a word in English. Some of these disagreements arise from dialectical differences in the way particular words are spoken. And this is what I was just talking about. For some, the word predatory has how many syllables for me? Has four. Predatory. Predatory. But in British, predatory. Predatory. How many? Predatory. But are we so sure? Predatory. Tree. Is it one or two? We don't know. Other people who pronounce it as predatory say that it has four syllables. Those of us who say predatory, we are sure. That's a clear-cut case. But if you're British and you say predatory, we're not really sure. Similarly, there are many words such as bottling and brightening. All right, how many syllables did I say it with? Bottling. Bottling. I have three, but I could say bottling. They're, they're bottling. Their uh, bottling operation is very efficient. Bottling. How many? That's two, right? And then brightening, that's how many? That's three, but how about brightening? Brightening. Sounds like, sounds like two. And I still often hesitate when I'm writing the word sign, Dan, in English. Is it lightning or lightning? I have to think twice. Even now, after all these years, I still have to think twice. So lightening is another word. It means to make lighter. Okay, they're lightening the stain. But as shan dian, it should be two syllables with no e. Um, some people pronounce them with syllabic consonants in the middle so that they have three syllables, whereas others do not. There are also several groups of words that people pronounce the same way, but nevertheless differ in their estimates in the number of syllables. And remember that the noun is estimates, and the verb is? Estimate, yeah. Can you estimate how many there are? Here is my estimate. And if you saw me talking to the Zhuqian at the graduation, I told her it's grad graduates, not graduates. She said graduates many times, and I had to tell her. 
Okay, zhi ye bing. One group of words contains nasals that may or may not be counted as separate syllables. Thus, words such as pessimism, mysticism, may be said to have three or four syllables depending on whether the final m mm is considered to be syllabic. Pessimism. It has to be an extra syllable for me. Pessimism. It's too awkward to make it just one syllable. Mysticism. Sism to me is two syllables. But people I can see would easily, could easily count it as one. A second group contains high front vowels followed by, I think that's supposed to be an L. That's, that's a typo. That's a typo. All right, we're going to continue. Um, a second group contains high front vowels followed by L. And that's a typo we need to fix. Many people will say that meal, seal, real contain two syllables, but others will consider them to have one. And that's because, that's because a dark L, especially after front vowels, has a little schwa before it, sometimes. Meal, meal, can you hear it? Meal. But dark L is not the only place we're going to find that little schwa. Where else have we noticed little schwas in American? After any short vowel, good, good, good. There's a little schwa there. So for me, it's a similar situation. It's not really any different from good. We'll have to count that in if we're going to count this. Meal, seal, real, I count as one syllable. I, I hear a little schwa. I just consider it a kind of diphthong because of the L. But others will consider them to have one. A third group contains words in which R may or may not be syllabic. Some people consider, all right, are how many syllables now? Listen. Higher, fire, hour. Each one has a diphthong plus an er sound. How many syllables? For me, you can prove it by listening if there is a linking y. So, higher. If you hear a y in, the, in there, that's suggesting quite strongly that that is two syllables. Higher, higher. We're going to hire two people next week. Higher. But if you say it fast, higher. To me, it's still two syllables. I've been trained to recognize it as one, but that's because school taught me to do that, not because I really believe it. If you ask me what I really believe, I believe it's two, higher, higher. How can you count that as one syllable? I'm sorry, I, I can't. Sounds like one syllable. In an hour. In an hour. We can, especially if we um, neutralize the vowel, if we weaken the vowel, it'll get closer to one syllable, but he's coming in an hour. I have a W there. How can that be one syllable? A linking W, hour. One hour ago, hour, hour. How many syllables? I have two. If I say it fast, an hour ago, an hour. There we go. I mean, here's the middle of our continuum. It's not really clear one side or the other. It can go either way, sometimes more to one side, sometimes more to the other side. But this is a questionable case. Okay, normally, for me, it's two syllables. If you asked me on a test, I would write one because I got it marked wrong if I wrote two. That's why. And that's what you guys have all learned in school, right? You give the answer the test wants. All right. And then you start believing, sort of believing, what you knew at the time was not true. That happened with many things in our lives. Schools told us, the teachers told us, this is true. We said, but what about this? And the teacher said, no, 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 you've got it wrong. You do it this way. You write it on the test wrong, you get it wrong, your score goes down. In the future, you change the way you believe. But you've always got this uneasy feeling that something's not quite right. And for me, this is one of those cases. Our has two syllables. Okay. Mm. Whereas others who pronounce them in exactly the same way do not. So people can pronounce them exactly the same, but they have a different belief about them. A lot of that comes from schools okay, in your education. Similar disagreements also arise over words, such as mirror and error. These two you should watch out because a lot of you pronounce the O, and you should just pronounce the, sh pronounce the schwa. So let's review again. Mirror. Mirror. Uh -huh. Mirror. Mirror. Error. Error. All right. When people are speaking quickly or more casually, they can sound like one syllable. Look in the mirror. And I use it myself. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Like fire. It's even shorter than fire. Look in the mirror. OK, he made an error. Error. Error I'm less likely to shorten, I think. But mirror I shorten a lot for some American English speakers. And also, uh, Liu Cheng. Right, I say orange. 
Now I go the other way. And that I get, this is laughed at by some people. I've read about it online. They think this is outrageous, you know, changing this word to one syllable. But that's the way we say it where I come from. Orange. I'd like an orange. 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 How many syllables do you hear? One. I only hear one. I'm only making one. All right. So you learn orange in school. Minnesota, we say orange. Okay. <laughs> it's just like caramel. We don't say caramel. We say, we say caramel. All right. Um, finally, there is disagreement over the number of syllables in a group of words that contain unstressed high vowels followed, vowels followed by another vowel without an intervening consonant. Examples are words such as mediate, heavier, neolithic. Differences of opinion as to the number of syllables in these words may be due to differences in the way they are actually pronounced, just as in the case of predatory cited earlier. So heavier, heavier. We can make it sound like two syllables instead of three. Mediate, mediate. Another one is min miniature. I usually say miniature, miniature. Xiaoxingde. How many syllables? Miniature. But you can also say miniature. How many? Yeah, I don't usually say miniature, but I can. So miniature, miniature. There are a lot of cases like that. So it is often not clear if a syllable has been omitted on a particular occasion. It is also possible that different people do different things when asked to say how many syllables there are in a word. So when you're asked to say a word in your language, you suddenly get very self-conscious. And you might say one e instead of one e, right? If you're just speaking normally, it's wan yi, wan yi ta bu lai de hua, wan yi, your tongue doesn't touch at all, no n. But if a foreigner asks you and they're trying to learn Chinese characters, you might say wan yi, right? So when you're asked to say something, you may say it differently, and that happens often. I see that often among my compatriots, among English speaking foreigners here. For example, when they're recording, they will say how many syllables there are in a phrase they have just learned. In a phrase, the book, the book, they make the unstressed function words into stressed, and also they add full vowels. Okay, so when we're asked to do something, it's usually not good data. Keep that in mind, not good data. And if you're teaching language, be aware of this. Okay, mm, some people may pay, pay more attention to the phonological structure of words than others. Thus, many people will say that realistic has three syllables. How many do I have? Realistic. 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 I say four. Realistic. If I'm saying it fast, it's very realistic. I believe I have four, even if I make it, even if I elide it a little bit. But uh, because it is like the word reality, which everybody agrees has how many syllables? Reality. Four. Similarly, meteor will be two syllables for some people, but three for those who consider it the same as the stem in meteoric. His meteoric rise to fame. How many syllables? See, we're using our fingers. And meteor has how many? And I suppose you could meteor. It sounds very odd to me as two syllables. For me, it is definitely three. Meteor, meteor. But anyway, different people will have different pronunciations, different judgments. That's the point of the section. Judgments on the number of syllables in words such as higher and hour may also be affected by phonological considerations. Some people distinguish between higher and higher. Higher, higher. My vowel is a bit different. Higher. We hired somebody. Higher and higher. It's sort of like what? Sort of like Canadian raising, remember? Knife, knives, knife, knives, higher, higher. Look, look at my mouth and see if you can see the difference. Knife, knives, higher, higher. Yomel. So there's a kind of Canadian raising here, although both of them have R as the next syllable. But in higher, ER is supposed to be an extra syllable. So I tend to pronounce the vowel more clearly, longer, and also my tongue is lower. Um, okay. Um, an hour, an hour. If it's woman, I often say R. Okay, that's our train. That's R, R, R. Our woman, I often say R. But if it's uh, it's hour. I wouldn't say in an R. That sounds really, that sounds like a letter. Okay. Mm. 
These people are likely to consider higher and hour to be monosyllables and higher and tower, tower or tower, uh, to have two syllables, higher, tower, because they have linking higher, tower. That's one reason we judge them to have two syllables. But others who do not differentiate between higher and higher and who pronounce our in the same way as tower may say that each of these words has two syllables. Thus, two speakers may pronounce higher in exactly the same way, but one will consider it to have one syllable. So in other words, what makes them decide the number of syllables is an abstract idea in their head of what the word is supposed to be. So they've got this abstract structure in their head of their beliefs about the word. For example, that higher, because it's got the ER, it should have a separate syllable, so we should say higher, and higher is supposed to be one. So it's our, our idea that something is supposed to be some way that will affect our judgment. Having cited a number of words in which there are problems in determining the number of syllables they contain, it is important to remember that there is no doubt about the number of syllables in the majority of sounds. Consider a random list of words, the first word on each 300th page of Webster's New World Dictionary. All right, everybody just take one word and let's count the syllables, starting with Sylvia, go. Good, but don't be, don't be shy, just go ahead. If it's wrong, I'll fix it. Again? Mm-hmm. Okay, next. Um, Carol? That's what it looks like. Yeah. But, Roger. I think it is, I'm trying to remember, gauge is G-U-A-G-E, right? It should be gauger. Gauger, yeah, it's something that gauges. And I hesitate because I used to say gauge myself. So gauger, and that's two, next. Maroon, make it longer, maroon, that's a deep red. It's sort of a purplish red. How many syllables? Yeah, next one. Uh, try stressing the third syllable. Remember what, what we said about O? Oh, I just read it in your notes. How do we pronounce O oh between consonants in American English, usually? As ah, right? Try again. Hmm? Stress. <laughs> Stop. Listen to it in your head before you say it. Put the stress on the third syllable. Stress the third syllable. Listen to yourself. Say it in your head. What is the little tune we sing to stress it on the third syllable? Say it with mm. Okay, Jerome? Mm -hmm. Right. Try again. Yeah, finish. <gasps> but make it a schwa at the end. Uh, the second to last syllable should have a schwa. There we go. Doesn't that feel good now? It feels correct when you finally, when you finally get it. Okay, so how many syllables? Right, and this is confusing about English because stress often shifts when you go to a different part of speech or a different form of the word. And that often happens with words from Latin and, and Greek as well. So radiometer, good, next. Right, now, we've just finished his little list and which ones are doubtful? Only temperate, right? Because that one might be a case of schwa elision, right? Temperate or temperate, okay. So there's complete agreement on the number of syllables in all of them except for temperate or temperate. In the case of this word, the disagreement is not over what constitutes a syllable, but how to pronounce it. In looking for an adequate definition of a syllable, we need to do two things. We must account for the words in which there is agreement on the number of syllables, agreement on the number of syllables. And we must also explain why there is disagreement on some other words. So when we're going to try to define or when we try to define a syllable. First of all, we find words that are clear-cut cases. We deal with those. And then for the other ones, we have to explain why they are not clear-cut cases. For example, because of schwa elision, that's one explanation. One way of trying to do this is by defining the syllable in terms of the inherent sonority of each sound. Sonority is xiang du, xiang liang de cheng du, xiang yin is a, son, is a sonorant. So sonority, how liang is the syllable. We can use that as one possible way to understand syllables better. But I'm warning you now that nothing is going to work. He's going to propose a lot of possibilities. None of them works completely. 
but all of them give us insights, so they're all worthy, uh, worth looking into. The sonority of a sound is its loudness relative to that of other sounds with the same length, stress, and pitch. Watch out for that. Okay, 粗体字, test, maybe. Okay? The definition. The sonority of a sound is its loudness relative to that of other sounds with the same length, the same stress, and the same pitch. So if we put them in a stress position in a word, then we can compare their sonority. Try saying just the vowels. Go ahead. E, A. You can probably hear that the vowel ah uh, has greater sonority due largely to its being pronounced with the greater mouth opening. Now that's something to remember. The wider you open your mouth, probably the greater sonority you'll get for vowels. You can verify this fact by asking a friend to stand some distance away from you and say these vowels in a random order. You will find that it is much easier to hear the low vowel, ah, than the high vowels, e, u. Those waves tend to get absorbed into the air more, and ah is a, will be lower in pitch, uh, formant-wise, and it will be louder because of the open mouth. We saw in chapter 8 that the loudness of a sound depends mainly on its acoustic intensity, intensity, how do we measure intensity, acoustic intensity? In? In what unit? Go ahead, Sylvie. Decibels. All right. You didn't need to understand the details of the tutorial, but we measure acoustic intensity in? In? Go ahead. Decibels. Right. That's important to know. The sonority of a sound. Uh, that's the amount of acoustic energy present. The sonority of a sound can be estimated from measurements of the acoustic intensity of a group of sounds that have been spoken on comparable pitches with comparable degrees of length and stress. Estimates of this kind were used for drawing the bar graph in figure 10.1. As you can see, the low vowels, ah and a, ah, have greater sonority than the high vowels, what? U and e. The approximate u has about the same sonority as the high vowel, E, and that's kind of interesting. So U and E have similar levels of sonority. The nasals, what? M and N have slightly less sonority than, but greater sonority than the voice, than a voiced fricative such as Z. The voice stops and all the voiceless sounds have very little sonority. So look at this table. And that is really interesting because that tells you a lot about sounds that we didn't formally cover last semester. So you can see that ah has got the greatest sonority if it's pronounced under similar conditions as the others. And then we go down the vowels, ah. Let's just go through that list. Everybody read them. Ah, ah, i, i, yeah, u, u. Mm. All right, you can see that quick drop off, that sudden drop off after the end of the what? The voice sounds and also non stops, the continuance. These are continuance, all of them are continuance. Yan Shu Yin. That's a really useful concept, especially in teaching pronunciation. And s is also a continuant, um, but it's voiceless. So as you get away from the continuance and you get away from voice sounds, you end up with less sonority. Okay, although some of these are continuants. Uh, both of them are voiceless, though. We do have d, which is voiced, but it's still pretty low. The degrees of sonority shown in figure 10.1 should not be regarded as exact measurements. The acoustic intensity of different sounds may vary quite considerably for different speakers. Thus, in a particular circumstance, one speaker may pronounce e with a greater sonority than u, whereas another may not. So this is just what they produced through their collection of data. It's not exact, but it gives you a good idea of what's going on. Um, let's just do one more paragraph. We can now see that one possible theory of the syllable is that peaks of syllabicity, now that's a word that your computer will probably tell you is spelled wrong, but it's a real word, syllabicity, coincide with peaks of sonority. So if we 
look at the syllables, what we call syllables in running speech, you will see peaks of sonority. And that is one way of marking syllables. This theory would explain why people agree on the number of syllables in the majority of words. Now when you see majority, you know that what's coming? Sorry? Oh, the minority. That means that some things are not going to follow this rule. That means we have not solved the problem. So always look, off, look, look out for words that tip you off, that I'm sorry, this is not going to solve all our problems. It's just going to give us some shin suo, that's all. Um, okay. Um, majority of words. In words such as visit, divided, condensation, there are clear peaks of sonority. Let's listen for them. Visit, visit, uh. Divided. What is providing the peaks of sonority in these two words? The vowels, right. Condensation. Is it still the vowels? Condensation. Is it still the vowels? Yes. Um, in these words, each of the syllable peaks has much more sonority than the surrounding sounds. The theory also explains why there are disagreements over words such as prism seal, meteor. Different individuals may vary in the number of peaks of sonority they have in some of these words. The final m in prism might have greater sonority than the preceding z for some people, but not for others. Similarly, the l in seal and the second e in meteor might or might not constitute distinguishable peaks of sonority. So you can see that this is a very interesting idea, possibly useful, but, but it's full of exceptions. So it is not really something we can use to definitively define a syllable. And I said one more paragraph, so we have to stop. All right, back to page 246, last paragraph. We're going to have to rush because we want to finish the, the chapter. Rush, rush, rush. All right. So, all right, last paragraph, page 246. A sonority theory of the syllable will not, however, account for all the observed facts. It obviously fails in a word such as spa. This word is one syllable, but it must be said to contain two, two what? Peaks of sonority. And like I said, in Bella Kula and a number of other languages, they consider fricatives like sonship to be separate syllables. So spa, and if you want to make it into a Chinese word, how would you write it? Spa. Spa. Or something like that. It would obviously be two syllables in Chinese. You do that a lot anyway, but in this case, it's, it's pretty clear cut that you would probably make two syllables of it because there's nothing else you could do. How else, would you, how else could you um, make that kind of a sound? This word is one syllable, spa. I consider it one syllable. But it must be said to contain two peaks of sonority. It consists of three segments, the first and last of which have greater sonority than the second. So here, since in our definition we said compared to the segment next to it. If it's got higher sonority, we consider it a peak, and that should mark a syllable, right? Because the put in the middle has got lower sonority. So here we have a dilemma. A sonority theory also fails to account for the difference in the number of syllables in the phrases hidden names and hid names. Hidden names. We've got hidden, we've got a syllabic a, a syllabic and there, it's hidden names. Hid names. Now, let's figure out what's going here. And let's look at hid names. He hid names of all the people. So hid names. Where have we got the sonority peaks? I in hid and a in names. But how about hidden names? Hidden names. Right, but it's probably got a pretty low sonority level. So, hidden, hid names. It's like we don't have a peak that's representing that syllable because A and H are high. So, hid, it's going to push it down. Hidden aims, A is going to be higher. So, the two vowels are higher than what's in between, even though we sense another syllable. Hidden names, I and A are higher. So, we think there's only one break there, but actually there should be three syllables, hidden names. For speakers who do not have a second vowel in hidden, each of these phrases may contain the same sequence of segments, namely uh, hidden names. Hidden names. Um, oh, I shouldn't turn the page yet. 
disregarding the pronunciation with a glottal stop favored by some speakers, hidden aims. Hidden aims. If we put a glottal stop in there, then it would be a bit clearer. Therefore, there are the same number of peaks of sonority, but the first phrase has three syllables and the second has two. Hidden names, hidden names. We will all agree on that pretty much. There are also a number of words that many people can pronounce with or without one of the syllables. Typical of these words are paddling, frightening, reddening. How many syllables? When I said them this time, let's try again. Paddling, frightening, reddening. This time it was three. Each of these words can be said as two syllables with a division between them as shown by the inserted period. Alternatively, they can be said as three syllables with a syllabic nasal or lateral in the middle, paddling, frightening, reddening. Some people claim that they make a distinction between lightning and lightening, and I can make a distinction, but I'm still confused about lightning. Does it need an E or not? I still have to think. So lightning, lightning. There is a distinction if I make it, right? Lightning, lightning. Lightning, lightning, I mentioned to the. But when I'm speaking quickly, I probably won't make that distinction. Thunder and lightning, lightning. That n may come out as an extra syllable, or um, she's trying to, uh, she's lightening her skin, lightening her skin. And between coddling and coddling. Coddling is a little cod, <laughs> it's funny to think of it as a little baby because we eat so much of it. And suddenly you think of it as a baby and it seems very cruel. Coddling. You guys are doing it. All right, bring it back to the Okay, so coddling and coddling, and that means chong ai. So coddling, coddling. In all these cases, the sonority theory of the syllable is inadequate. So the sonority th uh, theory of the syllable is not going to solve these problems. The variations in the number of syllables cannot be said to be due to variations in the number of peaks of sonority. One way of avoiding this difficulty is to say that syllables are marked not by peaks in sonority, but by peaks in prominence. How are we going to describe the difference between peaks in sonority and peaks in prominence? The relative prominence of two sounds depends in part on what their relative sonority would have been if they had had the same length, stress, and pitch. If they had had, that's another syllable, uh, kind of sentence that Taiwanese don't make, right? If they had had 假如他之前当时有过, all right? So instead of ju judging by their sonority in that particular example, we can look at the theory of sonority. Look at here, I'm pointing. We can look at this and say, theoretically, this one has a higher sonority than another. Rather than saying, in this actual example, it does not have a higher sonority. So if we use theory, then we can call these peaks in prominence. The relative prominence of two sounds depends in part on what their relative sonority would have been if they had had the same length, stress, and pitch. That's what they said they did with this table here, with this graph. But it also depends in part on their actual stress, length, and pitch. Then we can say that, for example, the n in hidden names constitutes a peak of prominence because it has more stress or more length, or both, than the n in hidden names. The problem with this kind of definition is that one cannot state a cross-linguistically valid procedure for combining sonority, length, stress, and pitch so as to form prominence. Part of the problem is that the perceived prominence of sound relies on language-specific weighting of phonetic factors such as length and sonority. Every language is different, so an n may be more prominent in one language than in another. And part of the problem is that what makes a sound prominent is its position in a word, where you put it in the word. Is it at the beginning, at the middle, at the end? Is it stressed, is it not stressed? That's going to make a difference. Thus, there is no way in which one can measure the prominence of a sound. We can't find this universal definition. We can't. There are too many factors that change it. And from language to language, not being As a result, the notion of a peak of prominence becomes a completely subjective affair. It does not really throw any light on how one defines a syllable. A sound is prominent because it forms the peak of a syllable. It is syllabic because it is prominent. That's circular. Think about that a minute. It's prominent because it's the peak of a syllable. It's a syllable because it's prominent. Dolatoma, we're going in a circle. We did not define anything. We're just describing it in two ways and using one to refer back to the other. That's all we're doing. So it doesn't work. A completely different approach is to consider syllabicity not as a property of sounds one hears, but as something produced by the speaker 
So here we're talking about what the speaker is doing rather than what our ear is hearing. R. H. Stetson, who suggested that every syllable is initiated by a chest pulse. Ugh. Yeah, with your chest. A contraction of the muscles of the rib cage that pushes more air out of the lungs. Okay, this is what initiates a syllable. Stetson made numerous observations of the actions of the respiratory system, but his, his claims about the actions of the muscles were nearly all deductions based on his observations of the movements of the rib cage and his measurements of the pressure of the air in the lungs. Unfortunately, subsequent direct investigations of the activity of the muscles themselves have failed to confirm his theory. So he had this idea, we had this push from our chest for every syllable. He had said he had data, but when somebody else <clears throat> tried to measure it, what happened? They got different results. So that's the key yaocho of science. It has to be what? An experiment has to be reproducible. You have to be able to re reproduce the same experiment and get similar results. Otherwise, it doesn't count. If one person did an experiment, got these results, somebody else tried to replicate it, they got totally different results. A third person got different results again. That's not science, all right? It doesn't count. So it is clearly untrue to say that every syllable is initiated by a chest pulse. Still, another way of considering syllables is to regard them as units of planning in speech motor control. Planning, now think about that. Some research on speech planning, that means suggests that syllable size motor control plans are stored in a mental syllabary, okay? Like in Japanese, kakikukeko, a collection of syllables. The support for this view comes from various sources. Consider, for example, the errors, slips of the tongue that people make when talking. Perhaps one of the commonest is the interchanging of consonants so that our dear old queen becomes our queer old dean. And there are a lot of funny ones. These are called spoonerisms. So instead of, um, somebody once said a well-boiled icicle when they meant to say a well Figure it out. A well-boiled icicle. Icicle. bing zu. Does that make sense? No. No? So switch something around to make it make more sense. That's right. A well-oiled bicycle. And it came out a well-boiled icicle. That's another example of a spoonerism. Instead, it is the case that there's an inter interchange between consonants in the same place in the syllable. Excuse me, I need water. To continue, are we ready? In virtually all cases of errors involving the interchange of consonants, it is not a matter of one consonant interchanging with any other consonant. Instead, it is the case that there is an interchange between consonants in the same place in the syllable. So we have this idea of where it belongs in the syllable, beginning, middle, end. Observations such as these are hard to explain unless we consider the syllable to be a significant unit in the production of speech. And you already know Latifo gets feelings on this from vowels and consonants. He believes that phonemes, vowels and consonants, are not necessarily the basic unit of speech in our head. Okay, we can analyze them that way, but he believes in our head that a syllable is closer to the unit of speech that our mind actually holds in its memory. Okay, I'm not so sure about this, but there must be some validity to it. It may be partway true anyway. Observations such as these are hard to explain unless we consider the syllable to be a significant unit in the production of speech. Further evidence of a similar kind is provided by descriptions of the sound patterns that occur in languages. We have seen in the earlier chapters that it is difficult to describe English or indeed any language without considering syllables as units. Since phonological descriptions are of speakers' phonetic plans, it makes sense that planning units like syllables would be included in phonological descriptions. So he believes that when we're planning what we're going to say, the syllable is an important unit that we use to structure the sounds we're going to make, the sounds of speech. In summary, we can say that there are two types of theories attempting to define syllables. First, there are theories in which the definitions are in terms of properties of sounds, such as sonority, acoustic energy, or prominence, some combination of sonority, length, stress, and pitch. Second, there are theories based on the notion that a syllable is a unit in the organization and planning of the sounds of an utterance. So the first one is about Acoustics, what we actually hear, okay? Auditory properties, acoustic properties. And the second one 
is the representation of the units of language in our head, the way we represent the units of language in our head, or the way they are represented in our head. In one sense, a syllable is the smallest possible unit of speech. That's Latifoged's view. Every utterance must contain at least one syllable, even if in Minayu, for example, it's m. Is m a syllable in Minayu? Right, nzai. Right. Or how about bomu? Right, exactly. Okay. It is convenient to talk of speech as being composed of segments such as vowels and consonants, but these segments can be observed only as aspects of syllables. So he says they don't really have their own independent existence except as how they belong to a syllable. They always in the end have to belong to a syllable. A syllable can also be divided for descriptive purposes into its onset and rhyme. And you did that web page last semester, I believe, right? The rhyming part of a syllable consists of the vowel and any consonants that come after it. So to uh, what counts as rhyme, it's the vowel. And then everything that comes after the vowel, that's the rhyme. In Chinese, you call it yun mu. OK, and the onset is the sheng mu. A fairly familiar notion. Any consonants before the rhyme form the onset of the syllable. The rhyme of a syllable can be further divided into the nucleus, which is the vocalic or vo vowel part, and the coda, which consists of any fi final consonants. So we have onset and rhyme, just the shengmu plus the yunmu. The yunmu can be further subdivided into a nucleus, which is the vowel part, and then the coda is whatever comes after the vowel, some kind of consonant or consonants. Words such as I and O consist of a single syllable, which has only a only a, only a rhyme, also the hang of this paragraph. Only a rhyme, which is also the nucleus. Ta yes, a nucleus, yes, a rhyme, and that's all there is, and it is a syllable. They have neither an onset nor a coda. Words such as splint and stripes are single syllables containing onsets with how many consonants in the onset? Three, and codas with two. Not two, okay, two, but some native speakers say that too. Um, sometimes it is difficult to say whether a consonant is the coda of one syllable or the onset of another. We've talked about that many times because we've needed to point it out for uh, teaching pronunciation. How do you divide a word such as happy into syllables? For this one, it's no problem for me. It's happy. Happy. When we were in Xiaoxue, we had to put a line between the two P's. For double consonants, we divided them in the middle, or for any two consonants. If it was plausible, we divided between the consonants. Others regard it as happy. I'm really happy is possible. It's not the way I normally say it, but it is possible. Another solution. With P's, with stops, it is not such a big issue, because I will usually stop before the stop, so happy. But if it is a liquid, right, like L or R, in the examples I gave earlier, like um, for example, melon or hurry, hurry, two R's basically, melon. In that case, it's clear that they belong to both syllables. Another solution is to consider the P as belonging to both syllables and to call it ambisyllabic, and let's make it into a noun, ambisyllabicity. The result of doing this would be to describe happy as happy with no syllable division. All right. Phoneticians disagree on the correct solution to this problem, and we will not discuss it further here. For um, compound stress quizzes, I accepted all kinds of different things, remember? Because they were all, as long as they were plausible. In speech technology, in speech technology, though, when a syllabification of English words is required, it is common to use an algorithm. What's an algorithm? That's a useful word, word everyone has to know in the world these days. An algorithm. It sounds like a logarithm, doesn't it? But a logarithm is much harder than an algorithm, at least the concept. And, and logarithms were not that hard. What's an algorithm? This is a calculation of... It's a very good start. Logic calculation? Yeah, you're really on the right track. It is just a kind of it's some kind of an equation, some kind of a formula that solves a problem, namely, usually. So here's an algorithm we use to um, identify the male as a 
posed to the female speakers. We find a way, some method that we can use if we have like a, uh, an audio file, for example. How we can identify male speakers as opposed to female speakers. Maybe we look out for certain uh, frequency ranges. So we, tell, we design a formula, a mathematical formula, to catch all of the frequency ranges within that we have um, decided on. So everyone with an F0 between um, 80 hertz and uh, 180 hertz or something. Maybe, it's probably a very bad algorithm, but it's an example of a possible algorithm. It's just some way of calculating to solve a problem, some kind of calculation. Hmm? My, my question is, uh, is in some file. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I remember somebody else looked it up before. Is that really clear in Chinese if you hear that translation or not? No. Wendy thinks no. Okay, so you need more of a description. Okay, I didn't, I didn't have a good translation ready for that reason, as I think I heard that before and it didn't really stick. In I think that the word is um, really clear. Yan Suan Fa. Well, then maybe that is a good translation. Okay, because that's what algorithm, an algorithm is. It's a kind of calculation you use to, to reach a certain goal, to solve a certain problem for a certain aim. You want to accomplish a certain task. That's an algorithm. So, yin suan fa is it in Chinese then? Everyone satisfied with that? Good. Oh, that's what I'll use in the future. Um, it is common to use an algorithm that will tend to maximize onsets rather than codas, which would prefer happy over happy and always avoiding positioning ambisyllabic segments. So this is what they often use in speech technology, and this is more like what we do in real speech, in my opinion, is we'll maximize onsets. So ha will be longer. Uh, we'll, we'll have more sonority. I think that's what they, they mean here. We'll have more sonority in the onset. Ha. And P will leave for the, for the end. So, and always avoid positing ambisyllabic segments. So, if it's in doubt, then what do we do with it? Like the L or the R. What are we going to do with this kind of an algorithm? Put it in, this, in the next syllable rather than in the, in the onset. Um, languages differ considerably in the syllable structures that they permit. As we have noted, English has complex onsets and codas. Hawaiian allows no more than one consonant in an onset. Is that like or not like Chinese? Similar to or not similar to? Similar to. In Chinese now, we only allow one, right. But People theorize that in the past, there may have been clusters, constant clusters in Chinese. And one kind of proof that they use, it's not definitive proof, but one thing that they use as evidence is um, the character long. Mm -hmm. If you add this to long, what do you get? Pang, <laughs> right? Now, how do you explain long and pang when they have the same they have the same phonetic. We call that a phonetic. They have the same phonetic, right? Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? How do we get from long to pang? That's pretty weird, don't you think? Because l to de hai hao le, to pe, different place of articulation. Some people, huh? Xin shen? Right. Some people theorize that it's because in the past Chinese probably had words like blong. That's what they believe. Because of words, because of pairs like this, long and pang, maybe there was a word, a, a, a syllable type a long time ago in Chinese like plong, for example. This is just to let you know, some people believe this. That's why I say now, at this point in history and for quite a while, we have not allowed initial clusters in Mandarin, right, in Chinese, or in any, most dialects as far as I know. Um, you can say that we, we have phonetic clusters, we have affricates, right, like c, that's two different sounds, mm -hmm. but they're one phoneme. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what level you're looking at it. We can get more than one consonant before a vowel if you count affricates. We have 
definitely have lots of Africans. Okay, so in any case, in Hawaii, they do not allow, do not allow Africans either. So Chinese actually has a much more complex system than Hawaiian. Hawaiian is, has one of the, the simplest uh, phonological systems in the languages of the world. So Hawaiian allows no more than one consonant in an onset, and none in the coda. So there's no un or ung or m like you have in Minayu. So Chinese is much, much more complex than Hawaiian. So that every word, for example, Honolulu and Waikiki ends in a? Vowel. Standard Chinese allows only nasal consonants in the coda, producing such words such as Beijing and Shanghai, right? Now, this reminds me of a recent dis discussion. This topic came up again. There is a book that just came out about China. I've forgotten the name right now, the title, if you want to. It's on my Facebook, actually, I think, um, or on Karen on Ivy, I think. It's a new book about China. I think it came out just a year or so ago. And he has a whole section in the book complaining about the BBC and other people saying Beijing. You hear Beijing. In, when people speak English, they say Beijing all the time. Oh, my son is studying in Beijing now. Well, then you should know better that it's not Beijing. <laughs> the BBC does it. I wrote them a letter before. They never acknowledged it, right? But what some people have said in defense of the BBC is that they know it's not correct, but everybody has started saying it because they didn't bother checking when they first started using the word often. We didn't really talk about China often when I was a kid because it was during the Wenge. There was almost no connection with China. It was so closed. So at that time, we just didn't talk about China much. But starting, why did I end up in Chinese? Hartley had to do with Nixon and the ping pong teams. That's when I learned Chinese. That's when I started. So that set off in America. And I was one of the first people of that, that fever. Okay. And from that time, we started talking about Beijing more often. Before then, we had relations with Taiwan as the Republic of China. And we were supposed to call it, have you forgotten? Good Lord, no, the city. No, no, no. We're not talking about Taiwan. We're talking about China. What would you call Beijing before? Beiping? Have you guys forgotten? Have, oh, wow. When I was a student in Taiwan, we were not allowed to say Beijing except in Beijing Ren. We could say Beijing Ren because that's a Li Shi Ming Si. But we could not say Beijing. We have to Beijing. Beiping. Beiping. So we say Ping Xi. We don't say Jing Ju. Ping Xi. I know, but you should have learned it in your textbook. You didn't even learn that That's so funny. Well, there's no reason to emphasize it because it's past, but you should know that that happened historically. So when I was your age in Taiwan, I had to watch my mouth. I was, we were not supposed to say Beijing. We were supposed to say Beijing. And if you said Tasa Beijing Ren, they would think he's a mummy. <laughs> not kidding, literally. I am not kidding. So, my point is, at the time, we did not talk about Beijing much in English because we did not have much connection with mainland China. Mm -hmm. After Nixon and the ping pong team, then relations slowly started opening up. That was still not the end of the Wenge, but they started opening up. So at some point, when we started using the word Beijing more often, they didn't check. And they just kept, kept thinking, well, this is a foreign word. And we say things like, gendarme for foreign words, right? <laughs> Zsa Zsa Gabor, gendarme. So when we say a J, they said Beijing. And they do that for other cultures as well. For example, a famous place in India, Taj Mahal, should be Taj Mahal. We do that for many words that seem very exotic. All right, so that's that. I needed to put that in. I still hope they change it to Beijing, but it doesn't look like they're going to. Stress. As we discussed in Chapter 5 in English, stress syllables and careful citation forms have that concept clear in your head. Careful citation forms is zi dian yin, I call in Chinese. And it's often very different from the way we really speak. Are often pronounced, in unstressed, uh, are often pronounced unstressed in conversational speech. This indicates that stress as a property of English words is to some extent only a potential 
for phonetic realizations that give prominence to the stress syllable. This pattern, which we could call the stress as a potential for stress, so they're using slashes and brackets to show you that stress is the phonemic level, that's the potential. Stress in brackets, that's a 真正的有放的重音 is probably true for other languages as well. So it has to be an actual speech before it, it's really the way it sounds. Therefore, when discussing the general phonetics of stress, it is probably best to confine the discussion to the pronunciation of citation speech. So it gets really hard because of intonation. The stress is going to change around a lot, right? I lost a hat. What kind of hat? We stressed it once. We didn't stress it in the second instance. But if we use the citation form, we can be consistent. Stress is a supersegmental feature of utterances. It applies not to individual vowels and consonants, but to whole syllables. Remember that. Stress applies to whole syllables, not just to individual consonants and vowels. A stressed syllable is pronounced with a greater amount of energy than an unstressed syllable and is more prominent in the flow of speech. That was in a previous test last semester. English and other Germanic languages make far more use of differences in stress than do most of the languages of the world. Having somewhat variable word stress so that the location of the stress is not always predictable from the segmental structure of the word. For example, to insult versus, uh, to insult versus an insult, or below versus below, or market versus marquette. So we have very, very complicated rules of stress in English. And when we English speakers go to learn Georgian, we have trouble because we want to find the stress, and we're always putting it in the wrong place. But the thing is, Georgian does not really care about stress. They just don't want you to put it in a funny place. So what you're supposed to do is stress the first syllable a little bit, and then forget about stress. So if the word is, for example, kar, 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 we would like to say kartuli. That's the word for Georgian, kartuli. But say kartuli, and you're safer. Just put the stress at the beginning. Because whenever you ask them about stress, they just shake their head, and they say, just put it at the beginning. They, they don't believe they have stress, and books say they don't really have it. But just don't put a big stress in the wrong place. Then it sounds dumb. It sounds odd. In many other languages, the position of the stress is fixed in relation to the word. So in as far as Georgian has stress, it's on the first syllable. And that's not completely infallible. But basically, just put it there, and then forget about stress. Czech words nearly always, and note that that word is pronounced Czech, just like zhipiao nearly always have the stress on the first syllable. And that's true of Czech. It's also true of Slovak, which is very closely related. Um, since I went to Slovakia, I looked into that a bit. So just put it on the first syllable. There are a few exceptions. Irrespective of the number of syllables in a word, in Polish and Swahili, the stress is usually on the penultimate syllable, which is the dausodiarga, second to the last syllable. Variations in the use of stress cause different languages to have different rhythms. But stress is only one factor in causing rhythmic differences because it can appear to be a major factor. It used to be said that some languages, such as French, could be called syllable time languages in which syllables tend to recur at reg regular intervals of time. We talked about that last semester, you remember? Mm -hmm. Right. In contrast, English and other Germanic languages were called stress-timed stress in that stresses were said to be the dominating feature of the rhythmic timing. He says we know that it's not true, but the tendency does exist. It's not absolute, it's not infallible, but it, the tendency does exist. I don't doubt that. In contemporary French, there are often strong stresses breaking the rhythm of a sentence. If you want to emphasize something is very important, you put a strong stress in. In English, the rhythm of sentence depends on several interacting factors, not just the stress. Perhaps a better way of describing stress mm, differences among language, languages would be to divide languages into those that have variable word stress, such as English and German and those that have fixed word stress, such as Czech, Polish, Swahili, and Georgian. Georgian. And those that have fixed phrase stress, such as French. So da -da 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 is sort of like the pattern for French. They have somewhat fixed stress for phrases. In contrast to the nature of syllables, the nature of stress is fairly well understood. We understand stress better than Syllables. We still have problems with stress, but we understand it better than syllables because syllables just have too many variables and it's too subjective. Stress sounds are those on which the speaker expands more muscular energy. And that's all we can say about stress for sure. Physically, we put more energy. 
more muscular energy goes into stress syllables. This usually involves pushing out more air from the lungs by contracting the muscles of the rib cage in general. Increased effort leads to increases in the perceptual salience of segments. So, it's in the sense that it's more appreciated. So, aspirated stops will have longer aspiration. So, um, competition, compete. Compa, not so much stress, not so much aspiration rather. No stress, not so much aspiration. But compete, more aspiration in the stress syllables. Um, voiceless consonants will be less likely to have voicing assimilation. If it's stressed, less likely to, be, um, to have voicing assimilation. And vowels, and there's an example of that with a tap. So example, for example, better, better. We've got T turning into a tap. And er is not stressed, right? Better. But for example, um, petition. Petition, no tap. If the syllable is stressed, we're not going to tap it normally. However, if there's intonational stress, we will still tap it. So listen, it is, it is, it is. Is it normally stressed? Is. He's a really clever guy. He is a, is. Is is a shutsu, not normally stressed. If it receives intonational stress, it will still be tapped. It is, it is. But if it is lexical stress, then it will not be a tap. So that's something the book doesn't have. That's worth writing down. And I needed to spell that out for somebody who asked a question on Karen on Ivy. So with intonational stress, you will probably still keep the tap. But if it's lexical stress, 字典的重音的话, 那就没有tap. Petition, not petition. Okay? Some people overgeneralize. If I don't tell you it's important, you don't know, right? Okay. <laughs> um, really, I haven't seen that in books before, so that's something new. Mm. And vowels will have more peripheral vowel formants. So high vowels are higher, low vowels are lower, and so on. So we're going to make them more extreme rather than being more neutralized. 不会比较不会偏向呃刷，而会比较到那个extremes of the vowel space. The increased perceptual salience of stressed syllables is also signaled by intonational gestures that result in more peripheral pitch, higher high tones, lower low tones. So, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, so the lower tones will go lower, the higher tones will go higher, and stress generally involves increased duration of stress syllables. So, 长度, 时间的长度会比较长. When there is an increase in the amount of air being pushed out of the lungs, there's an increase in the second line, third paragraph. No. Loudness of the sound produced. Some books define stress simply in terms, of, in terms of loudness, but that really is not true. It's not a useful definition. If loudness is considered to be simply a matter of the amount of acoustic energy involved, if you just make things louder, it will sound like this. The stressed syllables will be louder, but they won't be higher. That doesn't work. Okay, so just loudness is not enough for stress. Okay, and I also made the syllables longer, and I still, the pitch still went up a bit. But you can see that loudness is not the main thing that's going on with stress. We have already noted that some sounds have more acoustic energy than others because of factors such as degree of mouth opening. That's talking about which scale? Some sounds have inherently have more acoustic energy than others because of factors such as mouth, the degree of mouth opening. Which scale are we talking about here? Sonority scale, right, the sonority scale. Okay, I know this is hard because we're rushing, but this is what we got to do. A much more Important indication of stress is the rise in pitch, which may or may not be too, due to laryngeal action. You can check for yourself that an increase in the flow of air out of the lungs can cause a rise in pitch, even without an increase in the uh, activity of the laryngeal muscles. Ask a friend to press against the lower part of your chest while you stand against a wall with your eyes shut. Now say a long vowel on a steady pitch and have your friend push against your chest at an unexpected moment. We did that last semester, didn't we? I can just do it to myself here. Ah, ah, ah. Did it go up? Can you hear? Ah, ah, ah. It's going to go up. You can try it with a friend. 
Mm. You will find at the same time that there is an increase in the flow of air, 那个气的流量会比较大 and there will also be an increase in the pitch of the vowel. There's a final factor to note to note when discussing stress in English. We saw in Chapter Five that a syllable in English is either stressed or not stressed. If it is stressed, it can be at the center of an intonational pitch change, so that it receives a tonic accent, which might be said. To raise it to a more primary level of stress, and we talked about this in Dai Ying Wen.、Um, if you have just a syllable with one syllable, I'm sorry, a word with one syllable and it's got tonic stress.、Um, for example, in that、uh, that boy, it's that boy.、Um, if it's that boy, that whole intonational curve is going to go over one syllable. If it's that boy, right? If it's that boy, but if it's got two syllables, what happens? If it's that woman, woman, the tonic stress intonational curve is going to be spread over all this, both syllables. And if you've got three or more syllables,、um, uh, with this kind of consideration, that's only got two syllables after the tonic. Plentiful. If it's plentiful, if it's plentiful, it's spread out over the three. So, however many syllables you have, it's going to be spread out starting from the tonic over the rest of the syllables. And it could be additional words as well. For example, in that case, case is not stressed at all, but the intonational curve will spread over it. Okay, that's what they're talking about here. This point is important. You should put it in your notes. How the tonic stress intonational curve spreads over syllables, starting from the tonic stress. Okay.、Um, if it is stressed, it can be at the center of an intonational pitch change, so that it receives a tonic accent, which might be said to raise it to a more primary level of stress. Just a 另外一个层次 stress 的另外一个层次 If it is unstressed, it can have the full vowel or A full vowel or a reduced vowel. In some views, a reduced vowel implies that there is a lower level of stress. But in the view expressed here, we count it as unstressed, but with a different vowel quality. These are all all learned. It's in the fifth chapter. The things you remember. Do you remember? If you don't remember, review chapter five. Put that in your notes. Because what he's talking about here, we already did in chapter five last semester. Okay, and we also saw that there are a pair of words such as an insult and to insult that differ only in stress. What happens when these words appear to lose their stress because of a heavy stress? Elsewhere in the sentence, consider a pair of sentences such as "He needed an increase in price," with an equally strong stress on "needed."、Um, he needed to increase the price.、Um, he needed to increase in.、Uh, he needed an increase in increase. There we go. He needed an increase in price, with an equally strong stress on "needed." He needed to increase the price. Although speakers and linguists may have A strong impression that an increase is stressed differently from to increase in these sentences. Controlled acoustic studies have failed to find any phonetic differences. Okay, let's do it the way I did it the first time with only one tonic stress. He needed an increase in price. He needed to increase the price. Do they sound different? He needed an increase in price. He needed to increase the price. To my ears, they feel different. As a native speaker, he needed an increase. Increase stress on the first syllable. He needed to increase stress on the second syllable. In my perception, he needed an increase should be longer. But it says here that、um, they can't find any phonetic difference. So I suppose I have to believe them. But a native speaker will feel they're different because our Sense of stress is so powerful. It's so important. It's like your sense of tone. It's very important. You cannot forget about it. This appears to be a case where the speaker's knowledge of the potential for a, for a difference in the stress patterns of these words causes a phonetic hallucination. So I may be having this hallucination right in front of your very eyes. I'll read it again. I honestly think they're different. He needed an increase in price. He needed to increase the price. To me, they're absolutely different. He's saying that's a hallucination. Do they sound the same to you or different? Thank you. You're confirming what he says. Let's hurry up and finish. To me, they are totally different. Length. The individual segments in a syllable may also vary in length. The English of the Scottish Highlands makes a length contrast between weak 
and weak. And weak. Uh, sorry, the second one is longer. So weak and weak are the same for me, but in Scottish English, in the Highlands, apparently, it's weak and weak. Weak and weak. They have a length difference that I do not have. Both having the same monophthongal vowel quality, so they, they don't say weak and weak. It's weak and weak. No, no diphthong. In most varieties of English, variations in lengths are completely allophonic. For example, bit, bid, beat, bead. That's an allophone because of voicing. We saw, for example, that the vowel in bad is predictably longer than the vowel in bat because, other things being equal, vowels are always longer before voiced consonants than before voiceless consonants. Many other languages make considerable use of length contrast. Long vowels contrast with short vowels in several languages, like Japanese. Okay, and you can hear Estonian, Finnish, Arabic, Japanese. You can also hear Danish examples, blah, blah, blah. And we show it with this symbol, the two triangles. Contrasts between long and short consonants are not as common, but they do occur also in Japanese, in Luganda, and uh, Italian. So papa and papa are different words. We call these geminates. We mentioned this in class. Might be on the test. Watch out for geminates. The Italian Geminate consonants can be compared with the contrast be in, uh, between English consonants as in white tie and white tie, and we talked about that. Mm. But in English, geminate consonants can only occur across word boundaries, and, or in a word that has two morphemes such as unknown. Unknown, that's a double consonant. Probably one of the most interesting languages in its use, to, use of length is Japanese. It can be analyzed in terms of the classical Greek and Latin unit called a mora. We've talked about more or moras before. There was one day when I couldn't think of the word. Each mora takes about the same length of time to say. So, so the length should be about equal. And we know that. And um, Japanese words such as kakemono and sukiyaki consist of four more, but in actual speech, we may say sukiyaki. sukiyaki. How many syllables do we think we hear? Sukiyaki. Yes, yeah, sukiyaki. Yeah. Instead of Americans, we'll say sukiyaki. <laughs> okay. Um, but it has four more in any case. In any case. Mm. Another type of mora is the vowel itself, as in iki in breathe. In breathe. This word has two more. Each takes about the same length of time to say. And we'll skip over the rest. It's just about Japanese, and a lot of you are familiar with it. If you're not, then read over the text. We have more pages than I thought. Mm. Timing. Languages have different modes of timing. I'm not going to ask you to know this formula. You don't need to know this formula. You can think it out in your head just for fun. But he concludes that it is not really that useful anyway. But it's, it's fun to think about just to practice your math again. Now that you have this confidence, after doing logarithms. Okay. And this PVI, the rest is all about that. It's Pairwise variability index. I'm not going to go over that now. Intonation and tone. This you actually don't need a lot of help with. You just need to read it over yourself because we've talked about it so much in class. You know about tone from Chinese. You know about intonation from the Shida articles and from all your pronunciation corrections. Um, okay, intonation can provide discourse information. Pitch, pitch variations that change the meaning of a word are called tones. You know that. You need to know that. We talked about tones in African languages before, so this is nothing new. I'm now on page 256. And tone languages, you're also familiar with that. You may only know mainly about Chinese, but that tells you a lot. And a little bit about Mina. You, one ihan that I have is we didn't do romanization and IPA transcription of Minayu. We talked about it last semester, but I didn't fit it in. I'm sorry about that. You can learn it on your own. Okay? Um, remind me to post some links. I may go, just go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia for Southern Maine is pretty good. You can learn how to transcribe Minayu in IPA. I think there's courses for uh, Southern Maine in our school. Okay, yeah. You can take the class if you're really interested, if you want to go into that much depth and detail. But just for learning transcription, go to Wikipedia. You can get a lot there. So for the tones and for the vowels and consonants. We already talked about um, even tones and contour tones. So you've had that before. Tone sandi is 
the change of a tone to another tone in a certain phonetic context, like instead of hen hao, we say hen hao. That's a tone, sandi. You need to know the word sandi. That may be in the test. It's okay, sandi. <clears throat> and sandi are very, very complex in me. Now, one reason I'm sorry we didn't do that is because learning the tone changes in southern mean will give you a greater appreciation for your native language. So, for example, wa becomes wa shi. Wa xi, right. All of the tones change if something else comes after it. Declination, we talked about last semester as well. Downstepping, that means in all languages, we slowly, our pitch gets lower and lower and lower. The closer we get to the end of a sentence and the end of a paragraph or topic. Okay. And then finally, I'm on 260. We skipped over this, but time is up. And also, you read it yourself. You know a lot of this, both from your knowledge of Chinese and your English corrections. And from last semester, we really covered a lot of it. Um, stress, tone, and pitch accent languages. We'll go over this. It is clear that Chinese is a tone language in which the meaning of a word is affected by the pitch and that English is not, despite the fact that we can describe certain syllables in an English sentence as having high or low tones, as we saw in Chapter 5. The tones in an English sentence do not affect the meaning of the individual words, although they may affect the meaning of the phrase or sentence. English has stress contrasts, such as below and below, but not tone contrasts. We just don't really have tone in English. So far, we've been considering languages to be either stress or tone languages, but this is an oversimplification. Like many of the languages of Central America, Central and uh, Mexico, Inan, there are a lot of tone languages that combine tone and, and um, intonation. Swedish has stress differences that can be described in much the same way as stress differences in English, but it also has a pitch contrast before, uh, uh, between, for example, the duck Okay, anden and anden. The Stockholm, in the Stockholm dialect, the word for duck has a high pitch early in the word, then it would be anden. And ghost may have two peak pitches, pitch peaks, anden, something like that. Swedish phoneticians describe the difference in, as accent one versus accent two. We should note, however, that this is not really a difference in tone. So people who say that Swedish is a tone language are not really right. The base form of the word for duck is and with the suffix un, making it mean the duck. Un is a guanzi, they put it at the end. The word for ghost is ande, with the suffix being simply n. The difference in the composition of the words. So they're saying this is not really tone. This is, this is a morphophonemic variation. Scottish Gaelic has words that differ in pitch. And you can look at that. Japanese is a more striking case. It's sort of between a tone and a stress language. They have pitch accent, like hashi and hashi have different meanings. So it's somewhere between a tone language and an intonational language or stress language. That's it. That's all we are doing. That's all we are doing of the text this semester. The rest is up to you. The things that I pointed out, please nota bene. So pay, pay close attention to them because they may well be in the test. Make sure you can handle things like Sandi, Geminates, the other things we pointed out. Don't have to do the exercises. You are free to ask questions. Please post them on Facebook. Email me if you want a private answer, but it's better to post on Facebook so everybody can see it. We haven't been using the list very much or the page very much. Um, is there anything else anybody wants to ask before we dismiss class and before the final? And whose are these? It's Anita Oh, OK. I'm sorry. I thought there was somebody absent who wasn't getting their work. And I didn't think anybody was accent, uh, absent. OK. Anything anybody wants to ask? It's probably it came by in a, in, a big, in a big blur. So it's hard to ask questions. Anybody have anything you want to ask, like about the final exam itself or anything? OK. Make sure you've read through both chapters. 11 you've already read through and take, taken notes on in your notes, right? So 11 should be in order, but for 9 and 10, of course, 8. 8 you've also already also taken notes on in your notes, right? So 9 and 10, make sure you've read through the whole chapter. Things that we did not read aloud in class or go over in detail, um, you're still responsible for the material. Okay? Very good. We will see you on Wednesday.